Ken is the VP of Training at Assessment 24-7. She's also so much more. You're you're a coach, um, a mentor, a professional values analyst. Perhaps you can tell people what that that is in a minute. Um, An instructional designer, a mum, a painter, a singer. Um, And professionally, you help businesses and facilitators like me understand some of the unique um, results people get from, 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 from assessments. And it's really an absolute delight. I know you've traveled all the world, over the world, helping people with, with this, certifying others, helping people make um, a difference. Welcome, Jen. Is there anything else you want to add just so people know where, where you're coming from? Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, probably the only thing that I would add is I love what I do. Because it gets to make a difference, not only in my life and the way that I can use this information to be more effective, but also the incredible trickle effect that it has across the world. Everyone that I meet gets to also have this information and use it in a way that can grow their businesses or change their relationships. And this is not just something that's professional. This is something that applies to our whole life. It can work in any relationship, in any circumstance. It can make a huge difference if it's applied in whatever circumstance that you're in. And I love that I get to have that impact and that I get to connect with people in that way. So I'm so excited to be here to share even a little bit about what I'm passionate about. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for joining us in, in, in indeed. And t- t- today we're going to be looking at assessments just to really understand why they're so valuable for those businesses that are really progressive and growing. We want to really take a bit of a lens through the kind of the business owner or the leader or the execs um, perspective to see how they can unlock value. And really, that's the key reason that I've invited you, because I know you've done so much of this. You've worked across so many um, different different businesses, far more than far more than myself. Um, and I really want to just talk about some of those business challenges and offer up some solutions. Um, but I guess before we dive into that, let's get everyone on the same page. So what, what, why, why does a, a business leader start looking at assessment? So I would say probably the primary reason why people use assessments as a resource is because they want to get to the information that they can't practically see on the surface of what's going on in their organization, with their team members, in the relationships that are happening. It's not always fueled by a challenge or a conflict. It can also be fueled by we've had exponential growth and we haven't taken the time to identify okay. how our team has transitioned and what our skill sets are and where we might need to grow further or where we can leverage strengths we didn't know existed. So it doesn't always have to be there's a problem. It could also Good. be some things yeah. are fantastic and I want to know how to keep that trajectory moving. So there's a lot of reasons why a person or a group or a company or a leader would want to use assessments. Foundationally speaking, assessments offer some insight into the individuals that we're working with, the way in which they interact with one another and adapt to their environment, and how we can leverage them as the best way possible or mitigate any challenges that we may need to address, train through, take advantage of, whatever (laughs) it might be. Yeah. Yeah. So assessments Um, are a wonderful way to kind of see behind the curtain of what's happening on the surface. So really, really, really getting, really getting inside. Yes. I guess we've used that word, and I know you use that word. I've probably taken this from you from, <laughs> from somewhere. <laughs> Assessments really deliberately, yeah. uh, don't we? Because they're, they're not tests, right? They're not. So a lot of people make the assumption or hear or are, find them as tests. However, that's really a misleading term because a test, two things. One, there's an assumed right or wrong. And assessments are not about giving you yeah. your right, your wrong. It's about what's effective or what's ineffective in a variety of circumstances. And sometimes the right or the wrong wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> so it's really about these are the shoes that I'm standing in and how does that work or not work given my goals? 
The second thing is that a test is going to assume that there are parameters that are placed on things, that you have a certain expected kind of performance that would be a result of that. And we recognize that humans are far more complex than what we would put in a 37 page assessment report. (laughs) There's lots of different elements. And one of the things that we talk about a lot at the company that I work for, Assessments 24 by 7, is that these assessments work really well in combination to reveal different elements or different nuances to how we are as humans, why we do what we do, what we value, how we might communicate and behave, the ways we respond under stress. All of those things are so much more than just one visual of our personality that could be measured in a test. It's far broader than that. Yeah, and again, we have no right or wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. One one thing that I've I've heard quite a lot actually that kind of perpetuates that myth is sometimes assessments, not necessarily these that that, that you do, are used as part of a recruitment process. Mm-hmm. And the person being assessed never sees anything. Sure. Now, of course, they do have application in 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 recruitment. Um, but for that for that person that gets the job. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of a broader point. I see such a missed opportunity in not sharing anything from that report with the person who's joined. Absolutely. That's a very good point. A lot of, of organizations, a lot of leaders do not take that step to share the results. There's two reasons why that happened. One is that people perceive that the assessments when taken as part of hiring and selection should be private. (laughs) So we don't want to share what we learned about you or why we decided to hire you or didn't decide to hire someone else. And while there is a validity to remaining private or maintaining privacy for that reason, you wouldn't want to share someone's results with someone else, let's say. Right. But sharing it with the candidate can be very, very powerful in terms of growth. The second reason why there is a tendency to hesitate to share that is because a lot of people understand that when they're going through hiring and selection processes, there's a big transition that's happening there. And so sometimes those results are not going to be a continued element. So let's say, for example, a person is dissatisfied in their current position. They apply for a new position. We can see some of that dissatisfaction come through in their assessment results. If we know that that's what we're seeing, then we can look at this is probably not going to be the same thing that we see in 90 days when this person is settled into this new role and is feeling more satisfied. It also, though, gives us a lot of information about how do we support this person through that transition. So kind of as a general rule of thumb, a couple of things about using assessments for hiring and selection or for promoting and helping other people grow in their career. The first is I would only use it as part of the resources and tools. No more than 20%. Do not rely on the assessment alone to give you the information that you need to be able to make that decision with a lot of thoughtfulness. (laughs) Yeah. Do the do, the due diligence, find out what their history has been, do the interview, ask the questions that are showing up in those results. So if it's, are you dissatisfied with what you're doing right now? What would change that? What would be the way that we could support you in that? What kind of leadership are you looking for? So that you get to the bottom of why that dissatisfaction is present to prevent it in the future, for example. The second thing about that is There is a recommendation that when someone has taken a hiring and selection focused assessment, they retake those same assessments 90 days to 120 days out once they've kind of settled into their position so that you can get that snapshot of what has changed. Where are we now? How do we develop the person now? So in that 90 to 120 days, you can absolutely use the information that's in the assessment to show you as a leader How can I best support this person and give you some talking points to interact with that person to see what do they need during this transition time? But note that they may be a little bit different once they've transitioned and they feel more settled in their role and they know what the expectations are and who their team is and how to respond to their leadership. So it's definitely not something that you want to use as the only tool. You certainly want to follow it up with more conversation, more support, 
more tools as well, if possible, to see where are they once they settle in. Re really good tip. It sounds like from some of my experience, there's almost a gap there between some of what HR might be doing to use the test wisely at recruitment. And then there's not necessarily the follow up that could add a lot of value to that individual, their relationships. That was probably a missed opportunity for many. That I think is true. And I'm I'm not saying this next part to toot my own horn, but one of the things that we're very aware of in the assessments that we build is that the results can be applied in a number of ways. So even in our hiring and selection tools, there's a section that talks about using it for development. Uh, yeah. There are lots of tools out there. Our assessments are not the only ones. And they all offer brilliant, brilliant insight, depending on what fits your organization and what you're looking for. So this isn't a only use our assessments because they're the best. This is lots of assessments can provide really great information, provided that it applies to the situation that you're in and you understand how to use it. So any assessment has that possibility. Some of them are clearer in outlining how to use it in a variety of circumstances. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go from your not tooting your own horn. I'm going to go really candid now. Do so it. <laughs> from, a, from, a, from a business perspective, I guess for assessments to be truly effective, I'm assuming you've got to have some sort of base level. There's got to be certain things in place for them to work, to bother doing, to be open. What, what's your view on that? So in an ideal world, yes, <laughs> there is always the what would make this work best. And that is if you have a team or individuals that are very open, very willing to be candid and honest in their responses, interested in their own growth, they desire feedback, they're coachable. All of those pieces would be wonderful. However, yep. sometimes that doesn't exist. We may not always have a very open team. There may be levels of, dare I say, toxicity or conflict that can be a part of our organizations just organically as we grow. And if we haven't addressed those things, that can prevent us from being able to use the assessment results as effectively as possible. So one of the things that I always encourage is if you can at all create a safe space where this information is feedback that is a gift, whether you accept it or don't is a totally different conversation. But the other thing is that most of our assessments are based on a self-assessment, which means the information in the assessment is coming from your own perspective. No one else is measuring you. You are measuring you. Yeah. So if it can be prefaced with the purpose of this is to help us be our most effective selves and to be as effective as possible in our position, our role, our company, our industry, then I think for the most part, people will look at that and take it from an honest perspective and be willing to see the results. Also, there's not a lot of surprises that typically come up. What the assessments provide for you is a new perspective, sometimes language around why we do what we do, and it makes it kind of click into place. It's rare that someone says, oh my gosh, I had no idea that I did that. <laughs> Usually it's like, oh, that's why I do that. Or yeah, someone yeah. else will say, we see you do that all the time. It's so helpful for us to know why. So those, those kinds of things, if people are willing to be honest and they're willing to be coached and they're willing to look at the results as a gift and then decide what they're going to do with that, again, that's ideal. If you've got an environment where people don't feel safe or they don't feel like they want to share, there are ways to be anonymous, especially if you're doing things like 360 degree uh, reporting yep. where okay. you're looking at how's my manager, how's my peer, that kind of thing. We can anonym we can make those anonymous so people don't have to worry about their results being shared. The other thing is that the leader can do a really diligent job of creating a safe space. So I'm not going to ask you to share your results unless you're comfortable with that. I'm not going to put you on a pedestal in front of the room and tear apart the results. I want you to share with us what you think is relevant and useful. We're not going to look at your stuff without your permission. That can go a long way in creating yeah, a space. I think, that, I think that's, I think that's, that's re really, really key. I mean, it's one of, the, one of the things I always do is to, mm -hmm. to tell people to stress that it's not a test, as we've already, yeah. we've already talked about, yeah. and then give them permission to share as much as they want. So there's nothing yeah. hidden. Here's your no. full report. Yep. Bring it to the, the session or the meeting or the, the group, mm -hmm. and it's up to you then to share as much as you, you want. And yes. generally, and usually, in that environment, 
most people are saying, oh, we've all shared ours already. You know, we're yep. very happy. Yep. But the normal response. Or they'll ask a coworker, here's something that doesn't really resonate with me. What do you think about that? And the coworker can say, that's not you. That's something that, again, we realize you're human and not every single thing in a report will be specific to you as an individual. They may say, that's not you. Or they may say, oh, we've been looking for ways to tell you that for years. <laughs> so that's also the possibility. You might see some blind spots revealed. Um, okay. The other thing with that is if they are sharing just individually or as a group without there being a formal presentation of such, a lot of times it'll just naturally become where you can then use them for team building exercises. You can start to incorporate the language of the assessment into your work environment, and it just becomes an organic part of their day and an organic part of their experience. So it's not something that's scary to share any further. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just stuff about you and learning about other, other, other people, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah. And it can help us know like, okay, so if I know I'm not strong in something, I want to know which person on my team can support me in that, that I can go and leverage. So do you do this well? Can I get some help with that? That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes describe it. It's a bit like a third party, isn't it? It's yes, like, well, yes. This bit of paper said I'm that. I actually agree with it. What do you think? Mm -hmm. and, and for me, that helps facilitate conversations that would never happen. Yes. Very much so. Uh, you just said something that I want to talk about briefly. Um, you said this bit of paper says I am something. That is a good starting point. However, none of these assessments are designed to put you in a box or say you are something or you aren't. You Absolutely. have the opportunity to build on that, to contradict that, to bring your human experience to that. Some of the assessments are based on who we are as an instinctual result of how yeah. we respond to behavior and emotions. And sometimes as people, we have grown and developed and worked on things and we have lots more tools now than we did when we came out of the womb. So there also may be things where you think, you know what, sometimes that shows up for me, sometimes it doesn't. It's worth exploring. When does that happen? How does that happen? Yeah. How do I respond when that happens? The goal of these assessments is not to say you are this person, you will behave this way. This is what is predictable in all circumstances. Instead, it's to say, when am I that person? When do I behave that way? When will I respond like that? In which circumstances? And does that serve me? Is that effective? So it's yeah. not putting you in a box and saying you're a thing. It's saying, when are you that thing? And does that work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for picking me up of on my, my language. Much, of course. <laughs> much, 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 much appreciated. So let, let's get into some usage cases. For, for, for this so people get an idea of when you might need to use use what so I guess if I had a client and they came and they gave us a brief and say look I'm really looking to increase the productivity of my of my team okay that's yeah. quite vague but <laughs> where would where would you start so there would be a couple of different things that I would do and we've had lots of organizations come to us and say productivity is my, of my team is a struggle. Or as I said at the beginning, we've grown a lot and we've had a lot of success. And I don't know that the team is still connected the same way. So again, this doesn't have to be that there's a challenge. This could be that we've had a wonderful, wonderful experience, but we want to continue that trajectory. So yeah. when looking at increasing team productivity, typically there are two sides of that that we see in the groups that we work with. The first is results focus. So how is the team producing a result? How are we getting from A to Z? Yep. That is a particular focus of team productivity that we can see throughout things like the DISC assessment, because the DISC assessment looks at where are people more relationally focused or where are people more results focused? Yep. How do they take direction? How do they respond? Do they need step-by-step -step instruction or do they want to be given uh, freedom with fences? <laughs> Do we direct every step? Do we harness what we have or allow them to kind of run with it and see where we go, giving them a much broader perspective? So understanding- okay, so almost as, as practical as just giving them the right instructions in order it to- It absolutely support, can be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it absolutely can be. And the way in which that's communicated can either support or conflict with how you get to the result. It could be as something as simple as that. It could be that the expectations of what growth looks like are not clear. 
So again, how are we communicating that in a way that speaks to the kinds of people on our team and the things they value? If we look at it through a motivator's perspective, which is another assessment that we offer, the motivators tells us what drives behavior. So you may have someone who is very focused on getting a return on investment, working with a group of people who are more focused on collaboration and teamwork. Those are two very differing perspectives of how do we get to a result. So just by understanding that we have different drivers, we can address how do we do that more effectively. And sometimes it just isn't appropriately communicated in a way that everyone understands. So that's the first side is, are we communicating how to get from A to Z in a way that works? The second thing associated with team productivity, and I know this is just barely scratching the surface of all of these things. We could talk about it for hours, James. It's going to be a long, <laughs> long episode. Man. Exactly. The Lock second in. part of that is team productivity is not always only based on the result. Sometimes it's based on how well does this team understand each other? How well do they work together? How well do they respect and value where each other is coming from? So sometimes it's a matter of building the team as a connected tissue. It's about helping them to know each other more effectively, building a space where they feel like they can rely on each other and have the support of one another. So sometimes team building can be a very important part of getting productivity because once you have a solidified unit, they learn to work more effectively together. And sometimes they work even harder because now they have care, attention, devotion to one another. They're a group and they want to provide for the group in a way that they may not as an individual. It's interesting because as you're saying that, I'm thinking about different styles of leader Mm -hmm. taking a different approach. The first approach sounded more kind of, results orientated yes and obviously they are you can use both or combine them and the second approach sounded far more people orientated i make make the people happy as over simplistic <laughs> and they will choose to bring more of themselves to work and get on with each other and that will in turn create the result right and honestly most of the time it's a little bit of both right? We need to have the result focused and we need to have the relationship focused. If we're missing either part though, there's a chance that some of the individuals that work with us and that we lead are going to be speaking the opposite language. So if we're very results focused, there may be people on our team that are very relational and need that to feel effective and supported and satisfied in their role. And satisfaction and support is going to breed that productivity. So there's there's definitely a reason to have both present. And you're absolutely right. Both exist. Uh, that, that's interesting. I don't know if, if any, if, if you're making the selection, if there's any kind of unconscious bias that comes in that we, we need to almost help people counter. Because, you know, a, I don't know, an I, an I style disc personality might prefer to go down the getting the team bonding route whether that's right or do you do you encounter that how would you all the time (laughs) all the time (laughs) it happens when we are not paying attention it happens when we are so there are frequently situations where a team will be very like-minded very like styled so if we're talking about disc styles and your eye example where you've got a leader that's very relational and very energetic and very enthusiastic and very focused on the people, they often are drawn to people that are just like them when they're in working teams. So we'll select people that we get along with. We'll select people that have our same interests, our same mindset. The opposite is also true. If you're a very results-focused person and a very... um, accuracy-driven, precision-driven, detail-oriented person, because that's what you value and where you come from, we generally as humans make the mistake of that everyone else should be just like us. (laughs) So we are naturally drawn to people that are like we are. It reduces our tension in the way in which we communicate and interact. So we pick people that are like us. However, We could also be very intentional and say, you know what, I need more than just me. (laughs) And I need to pick somebody who does things differently than I do so that we have some balance. The challenge with that is that it creates a lot more tension because we don't always communicate the same way. We have diverse strengths and diverse challenges. 
It can be wonderful if we can leverage it, but it can also be a little more work to know how to communicate effectively with people that aren't just like us. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. It can go either direction. We can either get connected to the people that are just like us, or we can break it into groups that are very, very diverse. There are going to be challenges. There are going to be wonderful things that come from either. Um, but we do tend to kind of go toward our mothership <laughs> and stay in the, in our lane with people that are easy to get along with who are more like-minded. I, I guess DISC is probably more familiar to a lot, a lot of people. As part of this, you mentioned motivators. You did give a brief dis- description. Can you just tell us a little bit more about how motivators assessment works? What is it? Sure. So I'm going to actually preface it with a little bit about DISC. So if you're not familiar with DISC, DISC is based on the premise that there are four separate but connected behavioral styles. And the behavioral styles are all about our communication, about the ways in which we respond with emotions, our needs, our fears, our wants, the ways we operate in the world. Very simple, very easy to understand, very easy to apply. Very well known, (laughs) as James said. The motivators assessment is what is behind that behavior. So the motivators tells us what you value and it drives that behavior forward in an ideal sense. Sometimes we don't do what we want to do. So sometimes there is a disconnect there. But generally speaking, our motivators compel our behavior and they're based on our value structure. There are seven different things that we look at in the motivators assessment that can tell us why we do what we do. It's a fascinating assessment. It provides a lot of detail. It's kind of like if you imagine a person as an onion, the outside of the onion is the disc style and the emotional expression. If you pull back a layer, that next layer in is motivators. So it's taking a deeper dive into why do we do what we do, not just how are we doing what we do, which is what we see in DISC. Without now, the crying, hopefully. Well, no crying, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pepper in another one. So at that same level of motivators, there's also things like the um, emotional intelligence assessment. And okay, emotional yep. intelligence looks at how do we communicate and understand our own emotions and how do we respond and understand and communicate with the emotions of others. So it's also a second layer, I would say, about the same where you would find motivators. It's just a different viewpoint. And it looks at what are we experiencing and how do we communicate that? And what can we see other experience, others experiencing? How do they communicate that? And how do we respond in a way that is supportive and effective rather than in a way that causes more tension or conflict? And emotional intelligence looks at the model through not only the self-awareness piece, but also the social awareness piece. So again, it's self-focused and others focused. Where DISC has that same self-focus and others focus, we look at how do the styles apply to others. Motivators is really much more internally focused. It's much more about the individual. It doesn't make the same transition to others' motivators because we don't always see others' motivators on the surface. So yeah. there's a lot of nuance that goes into that as well. But just to give you an idea, they're all self-assessments. They're all driven by how do I feel? What do I think? What do I do? But the emotional intelligence and the DISC also give a little broader perspective of how does this apply outward, where the motivators doesn't make any assumptions that way. It says you need to tell me what your motivators are by the way you communicate, the way you express yourself, the things that you value. I'm not going to guess. <laughs> Yeah, because they're they're beneath the surface. You can't see, yeah? Right. Well, and as I said before, sometimes the things that we want, we can't express for a variety of reasons. So there may be motivators that are going unmet in one circumstance, let's say at work. We might might not be able to do the things that we want to do because our job prevents that. (laughs) Um, For example, I would like to wear pajamas every single day and not have to take a shower. That's not true. But if I work in an organization, people probably would want me to wear clothes. So depending on my style, I may have to wear clothes to work because that's what's expected. That may not be what I want to do, but that means that when I get home, I can put on my pajamas. I'm still getting my motivator met because I get to wear the clothes that I want to wear and be comfortable. But I'm also doing what's necessary for the environment to be effective, which is coming appropriately dressed. (laughs) Thank you for dressing for today. I can I can clearly see that 
the, those three that you that you mentioned, they all give almost a different dimension. So when you when you bring them together, really powerful. Very powerful. Now again. Oh. You don't want to use that to make any assumptions about anything. None of them are to put you in a box. All of them are starting points for conversation of when does this happen? How does this happen? How is this supportive? Or is it? There may be times where you find that some of the things that you're doing are ineffective and you don't know why. Some of this can reveal how shifting a mindset just a little or changing an approach just a little can make all the difference because we have awareness of what's going on in a circumstance differently than what we had before. I'm putting myself in the shoes now of somebody's doing the assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and each of these assessments, I don't know, they're 40, 50 pages long when you get a report out of it, the, at the, at the other, at the other, uh, other end, which is both a kind of explainer and a toolkit, most of, most of them. Yes. Um, but if, if I was to do three, I could imagine I'd be really overwhelmed as an individual with three reports of, you know, I'd have 150 pages to read. So <laughs> obviously you haven't recommended that. What would, how do you recommend that people sort of structure, structure these things or layer them up? What's your guidance? So I always start with DISC because it's the easiest to understand and it's the easiest to see. And it is the most practical to apply immediately and see a difference in the way we communicate and respond. So because it's based on behavior and emotions and the ways that we communicate, that is always the place to start in my humble opinion. <laughs> However, there's a little bit of a possibility you could go two ways. So okay. if it's someone that is very focused on self-learning and growth and has done a lot of work and is interested in learning more, sometimes they can do DISC and motivators together or DISC and motivators and EIQ, and they'll get that output and be delighted by the number of things that they can then take and run with. Others are not quite ready for that level of self-development <laughs> or that level of growth. Yeah. So you kind of have to look at the audience and see, is this person ready to take on more than one thing at a time? Or is it something that works beautifully in combination? So I also recommend for a lot of clients to do DISC and motivators together so that you can see what the behavior and emotion is and where it comes from. That can be a beautiful combination. I wouldn't necessarily do all three at one time. You could also do DISC and EIQ at one time. Two is probably a solid start. And then give it some time. Give it some time to get into your blood. Give it some time to sink in and marinate with who you are and look at how is that actually happening in my world. Apply it. Because what we absolutely don't want you to do is get all of these results, read through them and think that's very interesting, and then set it aside and never look at it again. That's absolutely not helpful. Not. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so yeah. take what you can, use what you can, and then look at ways to keep it fresh. Maybe once a week, you go in and look at a different element of it and think, how can I focus my attention this week on this? Or I didn't know that this is where this came from and that this is why I was reacting the way that I did. Maybe this week I'll focus on looking at situations that trigger that response, whether it's a good response or a negative one. So there are lots of different ways that you can take the information in there, break them into bite-sized pieces. The goal, right. though, would not be that you need to take the whole thing and digest it all at once, unless you are just one of those people that loves information and wants it all at once. And there are lots of individuals that are driven that way. Give it all to me and I will work through it. Otherwise, it might be smarter to say, what is this person capable of understanding? And then looking at ways to bring that into existence over the course of some time. So as a leader, if I was having people do DISC and motivators assessments, let's say, I would look at every week having a different area that we focus on results. So for example, if we're talking motivators, I would say, let's choose this particular motivator, we'll call this one economic for today. Yep. And let's look at who on our team is economically driven and who is not. And what does that mean when we're facing a problem? What's our mindset going to be? And I would bring that into conversation. I would send out emails that remind people, this is what the economic motivator is. Where are you seeing that show up in your world today? Let's talk about it in our meeting on Friday so that you can bring that to the forefront of their mind just building awareness of that it's available as a tool will go a long way, even without a lot of practical application. 
So that's one thing that I would recommend is don't just don't just read it and put it away. Even if you've done one, that's, that's really, two or three. really valuable advice because some people kind of think, and I don't mean this as a job tick exercise. I'm thinking beyond that, but some people think, oh, great, we've done a we've we've, we've done the workshop, fantastic, we've all got that, we've all got the commendation, great, great job. But then there's so much. It's, mm. a, it's a whole toolkit. It is. Assessment, I see, I view it as a whole toolkit that people can then then use mm -hmm. for, forever. But I guess mm -hmm. that probably does require a bit of uh, of prompting or encouragement or different things for different people. Yeah, there there is a level of energy and effort required into keeping it alive. And one of the best ways to do that that people overlook all the time is just incorporating the language. So if you are having, let's say, a new, a new product or a new process is coming out and you're communicating it with a group, as a leader, be really aware of what are the styles of the group that I have and what do they value and speak to each of those things when introducing it. So for example, if you've got a group that's mixed of all four behavioral styles, D, I, S, and C, you would want to share new information in a way that communicates it effectively with all four. And I'll give you an example of this really quickly because it doesn't have to be a big, heavy conversation. It right. can be as simple as we have a new process that we're going to roll out and it's going to be effective starting next Tuesday. It's going to do this, this, and this. That's for the D style. The second style, the I style, it's a new and exciting thing. People are going to love it. It's going to help you work more effectively and it's going to solve this problem, this problem, and this problem. It's going to be great. Then to the S style. Now I know that there's a lot that's going to be coming your way. It can be scary. It can be unsettling as we work through this transition, but I promise you we'll give you everything that you need in terms of guidance. Then the C style, let's walk through it step by step and talk about what is this going to look like as we go through this process so that you are prepared for what comes next week. Now there's a little joke. You got to do the D and I style first because they'll lose interest by the time you get to the S and the C style. But if, if you know anything about the disc styles, just in a simple conversation like that, we've covered what everyone needs to know to give them insight into how this is going to work. They may not have all the ins and outs just yet, but yeah. all four styles know what's going to happen and what it's going to look like. And it makes it so everybody feels prepared and is ready for whatever expectation comes next. Excellent. Really, really, really good, really good tips. And is there anything if you uh if you're creating a real high performance team, I, I, I guess there's some overlap, but is there anything that you would do differently in that, that scenario? There is. So kind of, we've, we talked about this a little bit a moment ago. I would look for creating a team of diversity. So knowing that there will be times where we don't communicate effectively, knowing that there will be some times where there are challenges or where we don't see things eye to eye, I would still choose diversity in a team over a team of like-minded individuals. And I would look specifically as a leader, how do I lead a diverse team? Because that can be very, very different than leading a team of all people that are like-minded, whether yeah. they're like you or different from you. You will have to learn as a leader how to communicate with all of those styles and what they need effectively, because it will be different day to day when you've got diversity present. But with diversity, you can look at where are the gaps in our team that we need to fill and grow and support the people on the team to step into their greatness and do what needs to be done to be really world class. So one of the things to think about is how do you help them communicate when they're different? How do you help them leverage their strengths? How do you help them support each other through conflict or through things where there might be um, a weakness? Because not all teams will be built of the same structure. If you can embrace that diversity and teach them how to be effective, that is going to create a connected team that is high performing. Excellent. I guess that that's quite a step change, isn't it? It is from for a lot of people. Described earlier on as somebody recruiting like-minded individuals to somebody deliberately picking the the strength and beauty of 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 diversity that has the potential, I'd say, to mm -hmm. to be better or superior whatever the right word is sure but it's probably harder to to reach isn't it It can be harder in my manage. experience a lot of people don't get to design their own team so you may come to the table with a team that has some diversity or little diversity 
That said, as a leader, you can still leverage what you have. You can still look at where might these individuals have things that we don't know they're capable of. They may show up in a particular way, but are there other opportunities for them? Are there other levels that they could bring to the table? The assessments will reveal that. You may have someone who shows up in one way, but when they adapt to a different environment or have a different circumstance or work with a different person, they do things very, very differently. And that could be something that could be really beneficial for your team. So the other thing that you can do is even if you are in a team that's already established and you cannot create that diversity in the yep. same way as if you handpicked them, you can still look at who are these individuals? What do they have to offer? You may have someone on your team who would really like to do something different and they've never been given the opportunity. And just by opening up this conversation and using this resource as a foundation to start that conversation, you can say, what else might you want to do? How else can we leverage you? What are areas you'd like to grow in? So you can also create that diversity in a team that's already established if you're mindful of that these individuals are far more complex than what I just see every day in front of me. Yeah, and I, I guess given that we are all actually a blend of different styles. Exactly right. Then could you by design just say, look, actually, could you up that more in this situation? And could you pull back? So you you can't change the people that quickly, right? but you could change how their roles and their behavior, mm -hmm. couldn't you? You absolutely could, provided that they're on board to do so. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're correct. There are lots of absolutely. ways. <laughs> there are lots of ways in which we are blends. In fact, most of us have more than one style at play. And sometimes we don't get to use our blend in ways that could be really effective. And so that is absolutely worth exploring with the team that you've got. Excellent. So let's move on to a completely different area because it's, okay. it's, quite, it's quite important for, um, I think, increasing sales. And that, I guess that's, yeah. that's not just that you don't have to be in sales. A lot of people are involved in, in selling conversations, aren't they? Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what, would you, what would you do to, what would you, what would you do to, <laughs> what would you recommend? For a, for, a, for a business leader that's, that needs to give their sales a bit of a boost? Sure, you're exactly right. So one of the things that I talk about a lot when I work with sales teams who are not selling anything is we are all in sales. We are all selling ourselves in some way to get whatever we need to get accomplished, right? So you're right. It's not just about increasing the sale of a product per se. We're increasing the, the sale of our relationship. We're increasing the sale of who we are as well. And this applies across the board. So what I'm going to give you is a different perspective than what we've talked about so far. So we've talked right. from leadership. We've talked about individuals. The best advice that I can give around increasing sales of self or product is know your audience. So you can take the same information from the assessment and look at who am I communicating with? What do they need from me? So if we go back to our previous example several minutes ago about is this person results focused or relationship focused? You can tell within a couple of minutes of interacting with someone if they are more driven by getting to a result, if they're a direct communicator, or if they are more relational or an indirect communicator, if they are fast paced, if they are slower paced, if they are choose and move, or I need to deliberate and get back to you in a week. There's a lot of different ways to observe how people behave and respond in the conversation and pick up on different cues. If you pick up on those cues effectively, you can adapt the way you communicate to meet their needs, alleviate their fears, and whatever their sales goal is, meet it. So if you understand how this works for you, you can then apply that information and look at who am I selling to? Who am I communicating with? What do they need from me? And how can I give them what they need in a way that works so that it's a no brainer? The sale just easily comes because we've created the connection, the relationship, the conversation. We've given the appropriate information. Of course, they want to buy whatever it is from you because they know that you've given them what they need. And again, it's a no brainer. Yeah. So it's all about recognizing who the other person is, what they need and want from you and communicating that in a way that works. Can, can that work at some level within motivators as well? Now, I know you can't necessarily, it's beneath. Could it work with motivators? 
It can. So you can dig <laughs> a little deeper with questions that may be like, uh, that may reveal what their motivation is. So for example, um, another one of our motivators is the altruistic motivator. The altruistic motivator is the desire to self-sacrifice for the good of others. And if you're high in that motivator, you want to do everything that you can to make sure everyone else has what they need and is successful. At the low end of that, you're willing to do some things to support them, provided that they've got some skin in the game, that they've done something to get to the point where you know that they are committed to the outcome, but they may need some help and you can be the person that helps. So there's a, there's a very different focus on how we apply altruism through that motivator. If you're working with someone and they tell you, you know, I just want everybody to be happy and I know that this particular thing is going to make it so that people are comfortable and they don't have to worry and they are able to take care of the things that they need to take care of, even if it's more work for me. That's a good indicator that you've got someone who's a little, little higher on the altruistic scale. So you can see it in the conversation. Now, we don't necessarily then assume that this person is always high altruistic, but if you hear that, then you can pay attention to in that conversation what it is that they're looking for and speak to that motivator. I recognize that you want to take care of people and that you know this will help them and that you're not upset or worried about putting in a little extra work up front to make it better for everyone else. Let's look at how we can make this work in that way so that you can get that done. So it meets okay, their good. need, their motivation. Good. So you could probably with, I don't know, three or four well-conceived questions get a better, a better idea about where they may be coming from motivationally. And you may not even have to ask the question beyond what you would ask about who are they, what are they looking for, what's the need that they're hoping to meet. The same kinds of things that you would do just in a typical getting to know you conversation where you're trying to learn about what it is that they're looking for. You may just have to listen to the way the conversation comes out and the way that it happens and then you'll pick up on those things. You may not have to say. So, do you want to really help people? <laughs> Are you self-sacrificing? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah I, 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 I'm but you're you correct. Sometimes it's enough, isn't it, to remind yeah. yourself yeah. of your preferential style, right? And that there are others. And just by doing that, you can then listen out for where they might be, That's rather right. than making making assumptions. And you can always ask questions to confirm. In my experience, if you're asking questions from a place of, of curiosity and authenticity, people don't mind answering them. Sometimes yeah. there can be a little bit of a hesitation to give a lot of information. But if you say, it sounds to me like you really want to help people and you don't mind putting in extra effort to do so. They may say, no, that's not true at all. But I know that if I put in the effort here, it's going to make a difference. In which case, you know that high altruism is probably not the thing for them, but they recognize its value in this experience. So then you can structure your conversation differently. And maybe what you uncover is they really don't want to put in that much extra effort. And is there a way that we can make the solution a little less work for me and still be good for them, which would make them very, very, very happy and make them very, very, very likely to work with yeah. you. <laughs> so you can also kind of use that as a jumping off point again for conversation and reading a little bit in between the lines to meet the need of the person that you're working with. Excellent. I can see how these things are building. The, yeah. the last one I want to look at is if we're developing really world-class leaders. Yeah. Is there anything that you would 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 add that supplements what we've already discussed? I absolutely would. And it is something that is so groundbreaking, so earth shattering that no one has ever heard it before. I'm just joking. It's something that we all already know, and yet it doesn't happen when we're leading, because as leaders, we focus so much on who we're leading. In order to be a world-class leader, you have to know you. You have to take all this information and use it on you as well. You have to look at the lens of how do I lead? What are my preferences? Where are the places where I struggle? What are the challenges that I have? What are my strengths? It starts with understanding who you are so that you can effectively share that and authentically share that. Um, yeah. I remember in one organization I worked with a long time ago, there was a leader who was fantastic and amazing and absolutely ineffective with their team because they thought the way that they were communicating was amazing. 
And it was, but the team was not that kind of communication style. So if they had been leading a different group, it would have been wonderful. But they forgot the pay attention to the audience part. They were doing everything that they knew that made them a good leader. They had taken leadership classes and they knew their style and they were doing all the things. And the group that they were leading could not connect to them and could not respond in the way the leader hoped, simply because that piece of understanding and applying it to the audience wasn't present. So it's twofold. You have to know who you are, and then you have to be able to look at who am I leading and what do they need from me? The second part that I will add, sorry, the second part that I will add to that is that trust is everything in leadership. And it doesn't mean that they have to like you. It doesn't mean that you have to be friends outside of the workplace, but there needs to be a foundation of openness, respect, and trust that is built so that that person knows they can rely on you as their leader. Even if you're going to give them a hard message, even if it's going to be a difficult conversation, they feel like they can come to you and will be supported through that. So those are my little tidbits. And again, nothing earth shattering. All of you leaders have heard this a thousand times before. Yeah. But it's really a matter of who am I? How do I apply it? And then lastly, is it consistent? One of the things that's really difficult, especially in an ever changing world that moves so fast, is that sometimes as leaders, we try to also be very responsive and it creates inconsistency for the people that we re- that we work with. If we are not consistent, I'll give you a scenario. <laughs> it's kind of like the dog you don't know if you can pet. Okay. <laughs> so really is good. this dog going to be very, very happy yeah, to yeah. see me and lick yeah. my face or are they going to bite my hand? And sometimes from across the street, you don't know. Because sometimes dogs with a very big bark are very, very friendly. And sometimes dogs that are very, very quiet and very, very unassuming are really, really mean. <laughs> So when you're inconsistent as a leader, the people below you, around you, interacting with you may not know who they're going to get. And that can take down a leader's ability to build trust faster than anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, so you, there's so been, there's been so many tips today. (laughs) I hope so. I I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't thank you enough. Um, And I guess. One of the things is, you know, people are going to take that. Hopefully people will take some actions based on what you've what you've said. Um, there's far more in, in within the portfolio of uh, assessments. Mm-hmm. We alone have probably got 15 to, to 20 that we've all got access to. Um, so what what's your advice if people need to actually speak to somebody about what to do for their level of team and their challenge? So if it's something that you are interested in exploring, absolutely reach out to us. We are happy to help you in any way we can. Um, There are lots of resources available and there are lots of different assessments. There are lots of different combinations. We have a number of solutions that we offer. As I said, even if you don't have a problem, if you just want to explore something or grow something, there are lots of different ways that you can do that. Not only from a team perspective, individual contributor perspective, hiring and selection, but also leadership development. So if you are interested, please, please, please reach out to us. Um, We would love to help you, obviously, a thousand times over. I want to add one other thing um, to this conversation, James. So I know that we talked about that we weren't going to talk about the book that I wrote. So I'm not going to, other than to tell you I wrote a book. And if you're interested, check it out. It talks a lot about the three assessments that we've talked about today, which is why I bring it up. However, I'm also not a person who only toots my own horn. So I have another book that I want to recommend for people. If you are interested in more about DISC and motivators specifically, this book is called The Four People Types and What Drives Them. And it talks about DISC and motivators. You can see I have sticky notes and all sorts of things in here, marking pages. I use this book all the time. It's written by a man named Stephen Sisler, who did an incredible job bringing together DISC and motivators in a way that is very easy to understand and very practical and was a lot of aha moments for me when I was very first learning about this information. So if you're interested in more and you want to look at even outside of the assessment world, what can I do just to pay attention to the world differently? This is an incredible resource. And so I wanted to make sure I shared it. Thank you very much indeed. And what what is your book? You got 
You can't kind of half promote it. What is it? Oh, Tell us. Well, okay. So, oh, let me let me grab one. I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> so my book, <laughs> my book is called What Makes Humans Tick. And it's actually a combination between my two bosses and one of our former colleagues and myself. And it goes specifically through disc and motivators, but it also talks about EIQ and some other pieces as well. And it's kind of like a reference material. It's more like something you would see in a classroom, um, but it's very practical. It's very useful. It's very helpful. So what makes humans tick? Four people types and what drives Lovely. them. Great, great title. I love the title. Amazing books. <laughs> if I do say so myself. And, and last, to, to, to somebody that thinks they are a fantastic communicator, <laughs> why would they get involved in all of this? It's such a trick question, James. So yeah. <laughs> most of us, even the fantastic communicators, always have somewhere to learn, always have something to look at. I do this every single day and I still have not perfected it because every interaction with every other person is something that could go awry or doesn't work out the way that I thought it would. And none of us are perfect. We're all so very human. So there are always places where we can learn and grow and pay attention differently and apply things differently. I'm also a big fan of growth mindset. So if you're not growing, what you doing? <laughs> and I feel like any of these resources are really useful in giving us new perspective. One of the things to know about the assessments as well is they're a snapshot of a moment in time. So they're a reflection of what's happening with you right now. And you know, we've had this wonderful opportunity over the last four years where our world has gone through a very global shift based yep. on things like COVID and the world being separated in a lot of different ways and there being a lot of turmoil. Some of us are different now than we were a year ago. Most of us are different now than we were four years ago. And many of us are continuing to shift and grow in ways that we never expected every single day. So all of this is a beautiful resource to help us stay connected with who we are, learn about what we've done, what we've changed, how we've grown, what we can do differently, and continue to build mutually beneficial relationships with others, whether personally or professionally. There is no one that is too cool to do these assessments and learn something from it. No one. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking <laughs> my, my hard, hard question right, right at the end there. It's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Everyone, please take some uh, some some actions. Think about what you want to do following following this, even if that's just to to find out more from uh, from one of us about where you where you take your where you take your team or your communications. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jennifer, for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, James. Thank you.